We have an exciting program today, and I'm fascinated to hear an address by Gene O'Leary, who is Executive Director of the National Gay Rights Advocates. She has a BA in psychology from Cleveland State University and has recently completed doctoral coursework in organizational development at Yeshiva University in New York City. She is a former nun and real estate broker and has been a gay rights leader for 17 years. She has been active politically, serving as a delegate to the Democratic National Conventions in 1976 and 1980, and also served as a Dukakis whip at the 1988 convention in Atlanta, Georgia. She serves on the Democratic National Committee as well. In 1981, she became Executive Director of National Gay Rights Advocates, and it, which is the nation's leading gay rights law firm. She will discuss key issues facing the gay rights movement in a speech entitled, From Margins to the Mainstream. Will you please help me welcome Jean O'Leary. Thank you, Bill, and thank you to all of you. I'm very, very pleased to be here today and to have this opportunity to address this prestigious forum. I know that many of you are opinion makers and decision makers in your community, and I'm very anxious to be able to dialogue with you today. As Bill mentioned, my talk today is called Margins to the Mainstream, and I was brought here by a group of, lo of local lesbians who started this campaign. And it's a wonderful campaign that's uh, still ongoing, and they've had a float that they had in the Starlight Parade. I think they've raised a lot of consciousness, and what they've really been doing is what my speech is going to be mostly about, and that is being visible and how important it is for us to be visible and to come out and to let everybody know who we are and who the gay people are in your community. I want to talk about the discrimination that we face and why we need rights to protect us, and most of all, why we need your help in doing this. Throughout history, discrimination has forced lesbians and gay men to live on the edges of society, the margins, if you would, or to work within the mainstream in denial and disguise. Now, things are better today than they were two decades ago, but we still have a long way to go. And in my talk, I would like to take you back a little bit into the history of where we've come from and a little bit about where we're going. Secondly, I'd like to talk about the recent events in Oregon and how they fit into the national picture and what's going on around on a state level, city level, and on a national level and where you are in that focus. And then also at the end, I'd like to uh, really make it clear what we want to achieve, what we want, and how you can help us achieve them and why it's really in your best interest to help us achieve these goals. So first, I'd just like to take a look back. This year, we celebrate the 20th anniversary of Stonewall. And that was a time, it was a sultry summer night in 1969. Stonewall Inn was a bar that had been raided over and over and over again by the police. And one day, one night, the gay community just said, no, we've had enough. This is it. We're not going to take it anymore. They fought back with bottles and bricks and with their fists and 47 were arrested. One died, but the face of the movement, the gay movement in America, was changed forever. And what was that all about? Why did they feel such a need to get out and do that? In those days, they were treated totally as second-class citizens. Gay people had no rights whatsoever. We weren't recognized in our families, in our friends, in society. But they realized that they paid taxes, they were citizens too, they were tired of being treated as second-class citizens, and that they were going to get out there. I'm sure they didn't have all these th thoughts that particular night. But the day after, the civil rights movement really started because of, so of uh, Stonewall. And all the fears that had been imploding inside and all that self-hatred then exploded onto the American scene, and we had a totally different situation. Now, once this happened, the gay movement moved further and faster than any other minority group had moved for a certain period of time. And this was because we are positioned everywhere in society. And as a matter of fact, one of our favorite slogans were, was at that time and still is, we are everywhere. We cut across every socioeconomic line. We are in every class. We are in every neighborhood. Every person here has a gay person in their family either generational or extended, 
but that's true. So you know us already, you love us already, you just don't know that we're gay. And that's part of the problem, so therefore you don't really know that much about us. And I hope that we can get into some of that dialogue today and how important it is for people to come out so that people can recognize us. Our other slogans that we had were gay pride, gay power, gay is good. And there was no mistake that, we, that our slogans were not gay jobs. And we are everywhere. We have these jobs. We are positioned all over society. Our job is to be able to keep the jobs that we have and be able to be ourselves. We don't want any affirmative action. That's not in the game plan at all. We just want to be able to be free, to be equal, and to be citizens, first-class citizens in society. So to that end, we started passing ordinances in several cities around the country. This was during the 70s. And about eight cities came up with the protective ordinances. And then we tried to get a national recognition of this um, through the media or a national forum. So we started the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force to try to bring to the public consciousness the fact that there was a social and political and cultural gay movement which was emerging in the country. And finally, we got on Good Morning America and a couple of talk shows, and we began to start to be visible. During that time, there were several milestones that happened. One of them was the very important removal of the American Psychiatric Association of homosexuality from its nomenclature. Now, this was, as, this was bigger than Stonewall, because we were looked at as sick, as psychologically inferior, a stigma that gay people had internalized and the society also had reinforced. Well, with the American Psychiatric Association saying that gay people were not sick, that this is an alternative lifestyle, they didn't go quite that far in their language, but basically that's what was being said, then you know we were free to really get out there and experience a whole different um, reaction to ourselves and from others to us. During this time, another, a number of initiatives and referendum were fought throughout the country, many of which we lost. One was right here in Eugene, Oregon. The big one was in Dade County, where we had Anita Bryant. And she sort of spearheaded all of these initiatives. And Anita Bryant was just horrible, and so was that whole campaign. I remember trying to get ads in the Miami Herald. They wouldn't even take our ads so that we could communicate to people to try to get them on our side for the campaign. And the day after they won, there was a big picture of Anita Bryant on the front page with her husband kissing her, and the caption underneath said, let me show you how it's done, fellas. So besides losing the battle and losing our civil rights, it was also being rubbed in our faces that your lifestyle is horrible and trivialized. But what happened was there was a backlash because of this. And gay people, after watching Anita Bryant on television and then seeing this horrible defeat, Gay people who had said, let's not rock the boat, please, all the, you people from Stonewall. Our closets will insulate us, they'll protect us from discrimination. They were clamoring to get on board. They were angry, and they started coming out. And what our enemies didn't realize then, and still don't realize now, is they do us such a big favor when they do these things, and they have these, these wars, so to speak, that force people to come out. I mean, it's like the floodgates are open because we have to defend ourselves. And every time there's another initiative like this, more and more people do come out. And what happens is the desensitization of society and getting to know gay people as people, getting the issue put out there and getting it talked about. Sometimes that's even more important than winning the actual battles, although the battles are important. Now, these gay people who felt this way had to just that felt that they were insulated, had had to live in such secrecy and denial, and they'd really had to turn their lives inside out in order to be able to pretend that they weren't discriminated against. And I don't know if you understand this or not, and for a moment, I'd just like to have you put yourself in our position and just try to, try to imagine if heterosexuality was the minority stance in this country and that you were the minority. And if everywhere you looked, you were bombarded and surrounded by homosexuality, and every time you turned on television or watched a movie, you'd see two leading ladies or two leading men, or you'd look up at a billboard and you'd see Kentucky Fried Chicken being advertised by a group of lesbians, or Boy George is the Marlboro Man, <laughs> um, it would be a whole, whole different scenario for you. 
And I'm doing this so you could just sort of, you know, get that reaction and see, you know, how we, now sometimes we don't really, are not conscious of this all the time because we're so used to it. But if you walk down the street and you were unable to hold the hand of the person that you loved because you were afraid that you would either one, be stared at, or two, uh, verbally abused, or perhaps even beaten up, that you would be unable to, um, to marry or formalize your relationship in any way. Think about that for a moment and think about the person you love and that, what that would mean to you. That you had to change pronouns on your job for fear of being fired, for actually losing your job. And what that does to a sense of self and your ability to love and how it erodes in a relationship that you might be in. And all these things we're overcoming. I don't want to paint a terrible picture here, but I just kind of want you to get the feel of it. Things got better during the 70s, and we went to the White House. We had a series of meetings with the State Department, the FCC, Immigration and Naturalization, the uh, Civil Rights Commission, Federal Bureau of Prisons, Health and Human Services, on and on. And all these meetings went, carried on for about two years, and we were making great progress during the Carter administration. There were many commission appointments. Federal legislation was introduced. We had elected officials, gay and lesbians, who ran openly and were elected to office. There were 80 delegates at the convention in 1980. And we were in all media, many media storylines. We were in serials, soaps, and we're starting to get hard news coverage also. And then we came to the 80s, and we were just cresting the wave of our power, and AIDS hit us. And AIDS has devastated our community. And AIDS has claimed many, many, many lives in our community, but it hasn't claimed the soul of our community, but it has been rough. It has been terrible. And we've wondered out there, who cares? And does our government care? We haven't seen much indication. We've had eight long years of silence from the Reagan administration. And this is a whole nother speech, but there is so much pain right now because there are 30,000 people who have been on AZT for two years, and they're just at the end of the line right now. And if they don't get another drug soon, we're going to see a number of deaths this year and next. We're sort of reaching the peak of the death curve for the gay community, anyway, with the uh, AIDS epidemic. And it's been uh, very debilitating towards our community. It's robbed us of our institutions, our leadership, and many times of our history. So I don't know exactly what the experience has been here in Portland or in Oregon, if it's been as dramatic as the experience in Los Angeles or um, maybe some of the larger cities, but I'm sure that you felt the impact and know what's going on. And it has really taken its toll. Um, even now, today, we're doing some very radical things like um, helping with the underground drug trials so that the drugs can get speeded up in their testing process very scientifically, but of course not run by the FDA or the NIH. And this is very necessary because oh, so many lives are at stake. And the FDA is investigating the trials, but they're also on the side talking to us about you know, how it's being done. And nobody really wants to blow the whistle or arrest people. Or people are just struggling for different solutions. But one thing that we have done is really push the government and I think that we've changed the shape of medicine and definitely sh changed the shape of testing in this country. And many other illnesses and people that have those illnesses are going to benefit from the process that we've gone from, through uh, with AIDS. But in the context of the political context, we have to ask ourselves, what is AIDS doing or not doing and what does it mean for the gay and lesbian community? And it's one of two things. Um, is it going to be this terrible backlash that we're suffering because, you know, the violence that's come out of it and um, the Jesse Helms amendments and Dannemeyer and uh, all the, the repressive things that have, have come out of the AIDS crisis? Or is AIDS really another desensitization process whereby we're fighting for laws, anti-AIDS discrimination laws? AIDS certainly has made gay and, uh, well, gay anyway, a household word. AIDS a household word. Sometimes it's very negative, but at least, again, you have that desensitization. And maybe on the other side of AIDS, which there will be another side of AIDS, um, maybe then when we go for our civil rights protections, it will be easier because people have been talking about this issue and people have had a chance to discuss and debate it. Um, all this is happening in a climate of very political and social conservatism, and it's very dangerous. And we look around, and even, uh, like, for instance, if we look at the court, the Supreme Court, 
Howers versus um, uh, Hardwick versus Bowers, which was two years ago, virtually stripped gay people of their rights under the Constitution. And I remember Justice White wrote his opinion. He said, well, sodomy laws were not in existence when the Constitution was formed, so we should, uh, they were in existence, they were intact, so they should remain intact. Well, blacks were slaves and women had no rights at all, so I don't really see that that's an argument for that. And I think that we have, you know, suffered a great uh, misfortune because of that decision. It's like our Brown versus Board of Education. We'll keep fighting. It might take us another 50 years. We will be back. We're not giving up. Uh, but it was a major defeat. The recent uh, Webster decision um, about abortion, that I think, you know, has really cracked the foundation of privacy that has been the basis for personal decisions about abortion for decades, even though it didn't address the privacy issue directly. And the rollbacks that we've seen in affirmative action are something that we have to really take heed and, and look at. The Supreme Court seems to be not only unwilling to expand and to um, even keep intact civil rights, but they are willing to roll back. And I'm not sure how many and which civil rights are going to be safe over the years to come. I'm just sort of watching with bated breath, as I'm sure everybody else is. You may agree or disagree with any one of these particular issues, but the trend is definitely towards very, very conservative. Um, along those lines, the National Endowment for the Arts, if anybody has watched what's happening with that, I mean, that's disgraceful. They have literally been censored by Congress. Now, they received millions of dollars from Congress, but $45,000 was taken away from them, which is the exact amount of money for the grants that went to uh, Maplethorpe and Serrano, who were controversial artists who used sexual themes in their in their works. I and mean, this is censorship, and that's Jesse Helms again that we have to thank for that. And the McCarthyism, I guess you could call it McCarthyism, that's going on in Congress right now. I mean, is it or isn't it? Part of it's a political turf battle, and it's been going on for years with the, you know, the partisan politics there and Republicans having enough, but they got down into some real, real dirty fighting. But you notice where it stopped, and it came to a screeching halt was when people started accusing other people of being homosexuals. When Tom Foley was accused of being a homosexual, all of a sudden everything dropped out of the news. Two days later, the guy who, uh, who made the accusation, Lee Atwater's person, I forget what his role was, was fired immediately. And I think this says a number of things, but I think the main thing that it says to us is that this is still so bad. I mean, they can talk about female prostitution, they can talk about what they do monetarily and the scams that people run here and there, but when it comes to homosexuality, no. Let's close, put the lid on right away. And um, what does that mean? I, th I think that it still means that it's a real hot, hot issue and too hot to handle. Part of me would like to have all those people come out, the Republicans and the Democrats, you know, keeping respect for people's privacy, but if things were out in the open, I think things would be very, very different. So against this backdrop of the conservatism that we're living in, um, I'd like to look at some of the gains and losses that we've experienced, maybe starting right here in Oregon. Uh, I'd like to congratulate you, first of all, on the recent passage of your hate crime statistics bill and the intimidation law. This is very, very good, and I think that it bodes well for gay people in this state, and hopefully it will be a precursor to some civil rights legislation that is desperately needed to protect people so that they'll be able to come out and report these crimes against them. Because it's, you know, if you have the bill in place and people are harassed and abused, but if they come out and report this, they might get fired then it's going to be, I mean, a very difficult situation. So I think we're going to have to encourage people to come out and report these crimes, but also get some civil rights legislation to protect people when they do, and just to protect them in general. And ballot measure eight, of course, was a very unfortunate um, happening here. It's the only place in the whole country, citywide, statewide, nationally, where there's actually been a piece of legislation passed. Um, well, it's not legislation. I realize that it was a popular vote unpopular in some sectors, <laughs> but um, where you've actually allowed people to discriminate against gay people. And I understand that that's being challenged now in court, and I'm sure, I'm just sure that it will be found unconstitutional. So we're just waiting for that day, and hopefully it will be overturned. Um, 
The, um, as we speak here in the next couple of days, there's a hate crime statistics bill that's being passed through Congress. And it's already passed through the House, and now it's getting ready to go through the Senate. And probably that vote will happen on Monday. The House passed it overwhelmingly. I think it was 436 to 37, something like that. But the problem in the Senate is Jesse Helms, and he has added an, an amendment to it that everybody must accept if we're going to then pass this piece of legislation. And it has four parts to it. The first part says that the homosexual movement threatens the strength of the American family. The second one says that laws, state laws prohibiting sodomy should be enforced. Just think about that. There's still 25 states with sodomy laws on the books. 19 of them also include heterosexuals, and he wants to have them enforced. He wants, in most cases, the enforcement would mean people being thrown in jail for what they're doing in the privacy of their own bedrooms. And that includes heterosexuals as well as homosexuals. Although I'm sure that's not what Jesse has in mind. Um, he says that the federal government should state that they will not provide discrimination protection on the basis of sexual orientation, and that school curricula should not condone homosexuality as an acceptable lifestyle in American society. So what he really wants to do is drive us so far underground that we can't even come up for air. This is going to be a debate uh, which I'm sure, fairly sure, will come to the floor. I'm hoping that he will be defeated. If he's not defeated, we hope that we'll defeat this amendment in um, conference afterwards. But it will be something that is uh, dealt with on the Senate floor, probably on Monday. Just uh, some more about the uh, hate crime statistics uh, briefly. He, um, on October 1st, President Reagan signed an appropriations bill that called for a major study of hate crimes by the Department of Justice. And this was based on a preliminary study that they had done, which showed that there were uh, a lot of hate crimes and the most frequent victims of the hate violence today are blacks, Hispanics, Southeast Asians, Jews, and gays and lesbians, and that homosexuals are probably the most frequent victims. The Presidential Commission on AIDS came out with a statement saying a public acknowledgement that there's an increasing violence against those perceived to carry HIV, and that uh, hate crimes are a serious problem. The Commission has heard reports, and the examples of the violent acts are indicative of a society that is not reacting rationally to this epidemic. And they urge that they all should be condemned by all Americans, et cetera. The uh, Center for Democratic Renewal and the National Council of Churches did a study, and they showed that a large spontaneous wave of homophobic violence appears to be sweeping the nation. And lar they are largely unreported, these crimes. And the, the study is called They Don't All Wear Sheets. And the report documented thousands of hate-motivated attacks across the United States since 1980. B'nai B'rith revised its model hate crime statute to include crimes based on sexual orientation, and other national organizations have passed similar resolutions. On a state level in New York State, uh, the Republican forces managed to block the passage of the hate crimes bill because uh, it contained a sexual orientation provision. So government, Governor uh, Cuomo passed an executive order that takes care of it in another way through the uh, district attorneys, and they're going to reintroduce that bill, and hopefully it will be passed. In Michigan, there was heavy homophobic reaction, and they did remove sexual orientation from the hate crimes bill. The good news is in Wisconsin and Minnesota, they both passed legislation in 1988 aimed at curbing anti-gay violence and other crimes motivated by bigotry. Um, bias crimes were also introduced in New Jersey and Pennsylvania in 1988, and they're still pending. In Connecticut, a law passed, and also in Connecticut, in, to encourage greater reporting by victims and to stem anti-gay violence, a statewide gay and lesbian anti-violence project was initiated. In cities, there are a number of cities, I'll just mention Oklahoma City and Columbus, Ohio, St. Louis, and then San Francisco, San Diego, Montgomery County, and uh, Los Angeles are all collecting statistics. So that's for the hate crimes. I just thought you might be interested in that since you had just passed that here. Other gains and losses that we've experienced. The situation is not so much now that we're taking one step forward and two steps backward. It's like a ping pong game where we win one, we lose one, we win one, we lose one. So I think we're kind of holding our own here. 
but um, I'm not sure which way the pendulum is, where the pendulum is in its swing. I thought that it had just about gone as far right as it could go and was going to start take its way back now, maybe with the abortion ruling, maybe with some organizing on grassroots levels and um, the liberal people getting their act together a little bit more. But I don't know, it's, it's, too, uh, it's too soon to tell. For the gay community, most of our victories are still won in the courts. And they're won on state levels, they're won on other levels than the Supreme Court. Um, we've won, for instance, many lesbian custody cases. There is something that's happening across the country, which is a lesbian baby boom, actually. I mean, lesbians are going out and adopting or having children um, in one way or another and starting families, and gay men are also. And I think that this shows a maturing of our relationships and uh, the gay community saying that we can have families too. We are family people. And you know, the things that were being said about us years ago, that we are child molesters and all that. I don't know how much of that is still going on in Oregon, but that that's totally untrue. And that um, we are able to have families as everybody else is. Um, they, there are things around the country called domestic partnership bills and redefining the family to include not just the traditional nuclear family, but other forms of family, not just gay and lesbian, but including gays and lesbians. There was, um, a bill that uh, passed, um, was signed into law just recently in San Francisco called the Domestic Partnership Bill. And it doesn't have a whole lot of teeth, but it's symbolic, saying that they, you know, respect in our relationships. And um, I guess it gave bereavement rights and visitation rights if you're in the hospital, which, by the way, is very important. If you think about if your lover was in a car accident and you were unable to go into the hospital and visit your lover, this happens quite frequently. They only let, allow the family in, but now, of course, this bill will allow people to do that. But this bill is now being challenged by the right-wing fundamentalists, and they collected their 18,000 signatures, and this will go to a ballot just as you had a ballot on ballot measure eight here. So it should be very interesting to watch in San Francisco, the great gay bastion, but who knows? We don't know what's going to happen with that ballot. It would be interesting to watch that vote. Um, we're working on all partner benefits, health insurance, visitation rights, et cetera, and we're making progress in those areas. <coughs> in New York State, the New York State Supreme Court ruled that the term family in rent control laws applies to gay couples. And this was over a battle that they had where if somebody died in a gay couple, did the landlord have the right then to come in and kick that other person out and take over the apartment? And the ruling was no, they can't because they are a family. And the family definition is based on one, exclusivity and longevity of a relationship, two, the level of emotional and financial commitment, Three, how couples conduct their everyday lives and hold themselves out to society. And four, the reliance that they place on each other for daily family services. So this was a great victory in the New York State Supreme Court. Um, we have 30 openly gay elected officials throughout the country on a city, state, and national congressional level. Uh, we've had numerous appointments on all sorts of commissions. We're placed in all political positions everywhere so that they're very used to us in democratic politics anyway. We still have to make some moves in the Republican Party and I hope that the Republicans here and the Republican gay people will start doing that. The Republican Party is right now where the Democratic Party was in 1972 when we first started moving and probably will move slower. But we definitely have to do that. <laughs> Um, at the same time we've had these kind of victories, they're having roll call votes constantly in Congress on the most simple things. Anything that has to do with homosexuality is going to be a roll call vote. And there will be some of those things coming up that are so, um, you can't even tell that they're gay votes, but Jesse Helms again, Dan and I are making big deals out of it. Uh, there's an, an act called the Americans with Disabilities Act. And they, we want to include people that have HIV-related conditions. And that means, you know, people with AIDS or ARC or HIV positive, because these people should not be discriminated against. And they, it is a disability, and that's been pretty much, you know, um, proven along the lines the past few years here. But th that is going to be challenged, probably with roll call votes. There's a national sex sur survey that the uh, Health and Human Services Department wants to run. They want to survey people to see what the sexual practices out there are and how afraid should we be of AIDS spreading. 
And again, Dannemeyer and Helms and others are trying to put the squelch on this, make sure it doesn't go out, because I think that they're afraid to find out how many people out there either are homosexual and have, again, that reinforced that it's 10% of the population or more, or maybe it's also just because they just don't like sexual surveys in general. <laughs> but um, I think it's probably a little bit of both. As I said before, 75 states still have sodomy laws on the books. They are very rarely enforced at this point, even though Helms would like to see them enforced. But they are used to do things like defund AIDS education programs, to deny lesbians and gay people custody of their children, and to bar basic civil rights protections for gays. So we do have to get rid of them, and we'd like to do that. We probably will do that through legislation, uh, some through some court actions, but we'd have to do that carefully. And of course, our federal legislation <clears throat> is still introduced and still sitting there. Uh, we gather more co-sponsors, but right now in Congress, the, uh, the focus uh, on everything has been AIDS. So these are the issues and these are the trends and what's going to make the difference and what do we want. We want an end to anti-gay violence. We want the government to care enough about saving our lives to do something, to get off the dime and really care about us and get these drug, drug, drug trials moving. We want full freedom and equality and we want our civil rights. We want assimilation, we want understanding, and we want respect for our relationships. <clears throat> we want to be free to be who we are and we want to be welcome to be who we are by all of you. And what is going to win out? Is it going to be bigotry and hatred, or tolerance, understanding, and freedom? It really does remain to be seen. And we can pass laws, and we can win court cases, and we can lobby our legislators, and we can run mass media campaigns. We can do all these things, but there is only one thing that's really going to make the difference. Gay people have to come out, and you have to help them to do that. You have to help us create a climate where you're working overtly for our legislation and speaking up when you hear gay jokes and stopping them in their tracks. That trivializes us. And you can laugh at gay jokes, but pretty soon you're laughing at the person that those gay jokes represent, and pretty soon that leads to violence. We have to understand the difference between privacy and flaunting. There is no such thing as flaunting. When people accuse us of flaunting, all we're doing is living our lifestyles, trying to, trying to be normal, trying to hold a lover's hand in a restaurant. That's not flaunting, that's just being real. And privacy is a two-edged sword. The invisibility protects us, there's no question about that. But it opens us to charges of blackmail and that we might be perhaps protecting a sordid lifestyle. So on the one hand, everybody should have a right to privacy, but I don't think we should make that much of it. I think really the emphasis should be on that we should be able to live freely and to be able to live openly. The fact is in order to have freedom in our private lives, we have to fight public battles. We don't have any choice in that. And homosexuality is not a choice either. It's a sexual orientation. It's not a preference. It's not something we decide uh, we're going to do one day like we go to the closet and decide what kind of shoes we're going to put on today. It's, it's not that way at all. Nobody knows exactly what causes it, but the experts do know that it's either by birth or by the time you're five years old, your sexual orientation is pretty much formed. We make a choice to act on it. There's no question about that. The closet stands in the way of progress more than any other hate groups, religious minorities, or unfair laws. And gays and lesbians must come out no matter what the risk. We have the luxury sometimes of passing and hiding. Black people don't have that. Women don't have that. Other minorities don't have that. But we have to want our rights badly enough to take the risk no matter what the cost. And the cost on the other side of it usually isn't as bad as what we would imagine. But the fears, of course, keep us in the closet. It's understandable. But I'd like to encourage you to take your next step whenever you can. And no one can or should rush this process. We started National Coming Out Day last year, and the whole theme is take your next step. Do it whenever you feel safe enough. And all of you have closet doors, those of you who are gay out there. Some are closed to family, some to friends, some are locked tightly on your jobs. But remember that these doors are locked from the inside, and I urge you to turn that key and come out whenever you feel strong enough. And others around you, the heterosexual friends, to support you in doing this. And then we can tell people the truth. 
You all know us and you all love us already. Again, you just don't know that we're gay. So the rumors and the myths get perpetuated. The stereotypes will begin to crack when people realize that we are in every family and when they realize that they've been dealing with gays in every phase of their lives. <clears throat> the stereotypes will begin to crack when non-gays learn that respected public figures and friends and neighbors and co-workers are gay. And hopefully you will become an important support in this civil rights struggle when you see gays in a different light, when you knowingly lunch with them. I wonder how many people are sitting with gay people at their tables right here today and don't even know it. When you are led and worshiped by them, when you play volleyball with them, when you consult them at tax time, when you agonize with them at parents' night. Gays who don't talk as freely as about their personal lives as do heterosexuals only reinforce the belief that their lives are not respectable. And until the respected lawyer puts her life partner's picture on her office credenza for all to see, nothing will change. Until the successful stockbroker summons the courage to join the lunchtime banter to describe the vacation trip he took with his boyfriend, nothing will change. Until Congress people, Grammy-winning rock stars and NFL quarterbacks answer persistent rumors by unashamedly saying, yes, I am, so what? Nothing will change. And until you have the strength and the generosity and take the time to help us fight our public battles and the quiet perception to strengthen us in our personal lives, nothing will change. We need you, and you know, you need us. Society can never measure what they are losing in productivity from people who must spend so much energy hiding. We can never count how many lives have been hurt when marriages that should never have been break up because somebody was trying to be gay. And we will never know how much intimacy has been lost between mothers and fathers and their children because the family is usually the last place that a gay person will come out because the risk of that love is so great. So I hope you will join us in our struggle for freedom. And I know many of you support us already. We thank you for that. And I thank you for being able to address you here today. Thank you, Jean, for a very thoughtful and uh, moving address. And the privilege of our first question today, as I mentioned earlier, is reserved to the board host. If you have a written question, by the way, please hold it up so the staff can spot you. And there is the microphone for those of you that are brave enough to ask from the floor. First, Ned. Thank you for those remarks, Jean. And perhaps to put this in some perspective, say internationally, I wonder if you could describe how the state of gay rights in this country compares to some other societies that we're familiar with and uh, where we stand by comparison uh, or contrast with them. OK. Um, well, it's across the board, again. Um, in uh, China and Russia, for instance, we don't exist. I mean, we are just nowhere. Um, in places like England and London, they used to have uh, very progressive laws there, but they don't anymore. They've been really clamping down, and they've passed some very, very bad uh, legislation recently. On the other hand, we have um, the Netherlands, and particularly Denmark, which just recently passed a law saying that gay marriages are legal. I mean, they've gone all the way and taken the big last step, which is what we're looking for in our lives to, you know, have our relationships recognized like that. So it's a potpourri of, um, of uh, different things depending on where you are. Western civilized countries usually are a little more progressive, but, uh, and they're more progressive than we are to a certain extent, particularly in their sodomy laws and that kind of an attitude. To what extent have you tracked the IRS doing special audits on highly visible gay and lesbian leaders? <laughs> well, 
I don't know, they're tracking me. I've been audited the past three years. <laughs> um, no, I'm just kidding. I'm really I'm kidding. <laughs> I don't think they do that. Um, I'm not sure. I, I just make this an I thing because I haven't tracked it. Um, I don't know what they're doing. I wouldn't be afraid of it. I know that we did sue the uh, FDA and the NIH last year, and I did get audited for the first time. But um, I don't think it really has anything to do with that. Uh, I'm not being naive about things. I think those things definitely happen, but it's not something that I've heard a lot about. Uh, Phil, don't remember the club. Uh, I appreciate your remarks, remarks very much, Jane. I, uh, it's kind of hard for me to ask this question. I've been spending the last week in Washington working on this National Endowment for the Arts problem uh, and hoping that it, it will survive the, uh, the attack. Uh, that's being made on it, and what's happened is we sort of have uh, won the battle and lost the war. But uh, let me expand a little bit. The the two photographic exhibits, one was perceived in Washington as anti-Christian, and the other was perceived as pro-gay. And so groups like the American Family Association were able to produce 40,000 letters in two weeks to congressional offices to, you know, eliminate the National Endowment. Now my question is, is there any hope at all that, that mainline Christian groups, uh, perhaps even including some fundamentalist groups and, and certainly the Catholic Church, can ever get together on these issues of the, of, of the First Amendment, privacy, uh, and, and civil rights, and these kinds of things so that we can sort of get together rather than being so, so single-issuely divided on this, this, this problem? Well, I don't know the answer to that question, and it's a dilemma that uh, I think everybody struggles with, and we, we think about it so often. What happens instead is, again, it's that pendulum swing just goes back and forth from the right to the left, and the very radical people on the left come out and push all sorts of extraordinary demands, and then the fundamental, then mainly just the conservatives get tired of that, and then the fundamentalist, and it moves back towards the middle, and then the, the more radical right takes over and pushes it more to the right. And um, I think that the radical right, right reached their peak in terms of their mailing list and their ability to influence uh, people in 1980. And actually, they took credit for Ronald Reagan's election. I don't know if they can do that fully. But what we have is a society that's just constantly fighting. They're not looking for coalition building or middle grounds. I think that we can basically agree on our Constitution, but only just basically. And as we've seen, there's so many different interpretations of it. And um, I mean, the people want to open up the Constitution for constitutional amendments, for the, you know, the issue around the flag. And Bush is promoting that for politics. I mean, you know, I don't know what kind of a society we're living in right now. And I hope that, I hope that we will get mobilized and we will understand what's starting to creep up on us and get out there and get involved wherever. It doesn't have to be the gay and lesbian movement, but just, you know, liberal-minded people, even just moderate people, realize what's happening <laughs> in this society. Charlie? Charlie Davis, member. <clears throat> I'm reminded of a story about a very prominent politician who was, uh, part of his prominence came from being controversial. Someone asked him uh, if he would support them for election, and he said yes. You want me to come out for you or against you? Which will be most effective? <laughs> and I think that I'd like to ask the question of uh, uh, that, that your organization faces, and a lot of other organizations do, uh, in our society at this point, where uh, the issue is getting good people elected, and the question of providing support for those good people uh, in the public forum. Uh, poses a, a balancing problem. How do you resolve that balancing problem? Or do you agree that there is one? I agree that there is one. Um, I assume, I'm, if, if I'm hearing you correctly, that your question is, uh, should gays and lesbians support the candidates that we really want to get elected? <laughs> <laughs> That's my question. <laughs> 
Yes, <laughs> I think so. Um, although I'm not going to just trivialize this question because I have struggled with it for years, and particularly being a good Democrat and being uh, in the on the Democratic National Committee and working within the party for 15 years. But you know, the thing is, when we would make jokes, you know, let's have lesbians for Reagan. Um, and we'll all come out with signs and stand out there while he's talking. Actually, this would work much better on a, on a more local level. Um, but um, it's, what it comes down to is we have to be ourselves. We have to have the strength to be ourselves, and people have to have the strength around us to support us. And this isn't just for gays and lesbians. This is for any perhaps controversial or unpopular group. It's going to be a slow process then. Maybe it'll slow things down a little bit. But the reason that we don't have any choice in this matter is we don't call the shots. If all the moderate gays and lesbians decided that we were going to make a plan now not to um, be visible on the abortion issue, not to come out for um, a particular politician that's being elected because we thought, and perhaps wrongly so, that, and, and quite, quite possibly wrongly so, that this would influence votes in a negative direction, still, we would have other gays and lesbians who don't, we don't control them. So we've got to be in there just doing what we're supposed to be doing and supporting the candidates that we believe in. And what I think we should do is get the strength, and we are getting the strength as gays and lesbians so that every politician out there wants our support. We have the ability to raise money. We have the ability to produce votes. Our votes should actually be sought after. And that's what I've come down to in terms of the bottom line. Peter Livingston, City Club member. During the Measure 8 campaign, there was a perception that one of Oregon's senators was supporting the proponents of Measure 8. And subsequently, there was an effort made to expose the senator as homosexual. Do you think that's an appropriate form of political action for homosexuals? It's very tempting. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mind people being in the closet, and I'll protect the closet as strongly as anybody else, despite everything that I've said about coming out. But when people use that closet and hide behind that closet to then do things that are going to impair gays, impair gay rights, that are, you know, there is no excuse for this. And I think that they should know that they should be put on notice that it's not going to be an easy road for them. I wouldn't have said this a few years ago. But now it's getting so bad that it's kind of like you have to take a stand. If you're gay, uh, it, protect yourself okay, but don't come out against us. It's like the gay person at the office who will tell joke after joke after gay joke um, just to prove to everybody else that they're not gay. Now, of course, this is on a different level, and I would never recommend exposing that person, even though that is also tempting. But when you have people who are in legislative positions and positions of power who use their power to do this, and then they are also gay. Hi, Jean. Beth Kay, City Club member. I'd like to know if you think there's a special role for lesbians in the leadership of the lesbian and gay movement now, in particular with regards to coalition building and any other observations you might have about that. Well, I've always thought that there's a special role for women. Um, there's a role for women, there's a role for men. Um, in terms of the coalition building, maybe the coalitions with uh, people who are working on the abortion issue, for instance. Um, I know that um, uh, because of AIDS, we are losing so much of our male leadership that there are so many vacuums out there and so many holes to be filled that right, you know, just for that, we need women to come up through the ranks and be strong and take those leadership positions. Um, I also think that it's wonderful to have women spokespeople. I think that it does a lot of good for our cause. And it does a lot of good for lesbians because when the gay, I mean, when the general population thinks about gay, they usually always think about gay men. And they never think about lesbians. So it's time that we get out there and we put our point of view and we put it in the way that we can put it and uh, describe it to society. Sometimes I think it's heard more clearly. Um, sometimes not. But I think it's definitely a voice that should be heard.
You talked a little bit about coalition building. I'd be curious uh, on issues such as the civil rights issues you described in your speech, if you would talk a little bit about uh, your efforts to work with other groups, whether they be black or women's groups or others, uh, if you could describe some of those and what your success has been in bringing those together so that it was a broader issue base. The gay movement has always <clears throat> Uh, tried to work in coalition with other minority groups uh, since its inception. And sometimes we're more successful than other times. Um, we come together, gay people are everywhere. We have to start with that premise. And we're black, we're white, we're female, we're male. And we are again in every single class. And so we tried to gather gay people together and then non-gay people also who are of minority stature. Um, and this also includes other groups, you know, unions, and um, once in a while even Republicans. Uh, but people, <laughs> but we try to form coalitions wherever we can. And I think that the basic bottom line is we don't exclude anyone. Dennis Cusack, City Club member. You mentioned a few minutes ago that I think there were 30 or so of the, the uh, congressmen that were gay. How many of those uh, uh, were gay when uh, they were elected and it was known to the, to the voters that that was the case? Okay, there's 30 elected officials across the country who are gay on all sorts of levels. There's only two openly congressmen. That's Barney Franks and Gary Studs. And neither one of them were openly gay when they were elected. I'm trying to think if somebody's running now. There's a man, uh, David Clarenbach, in uh, Wisconsin, and he's in the state legislature. And I think that he plans on running for Congress at some point. And if so, he'll do so as an openly gay person. I think there's three or four attempts that are going to be made at that in the next two or three years. You've talked about the importance of visibility in this effort, Janice Wilson, City Club member. Uh, what do you think is the relative uh, role of the media campaigns, such as the margins to the mainstream, as opposed to the individual coming out efforts that you've discussed? Well, I think that the role of the margins to the mainstream campaign is to direct individuals to, to do this, to be more visible. What margins to the mainstream has done, oh, I see what you're saying, um, so far has, you know, they've run ads in of the Oregonian, um, they had a float in the Starlight Parade, which influenced the hundreds of thousands of people because it was a marvelous float. It's educational efforts is what it is. So you saw the whole float go by and all these wonderful people on it, and then the little sign in the back that said, the gay and lesbian community. And I guess everybody was cheering the float, and then they'd see the, oh, <laughs> my goodness, it's this, and the shock. And so the, the, um, the educational value of that is wonderful. Everybody's cheering this wonderful, what looks like everybody else and it is like everybody else float. And then they see that this is attributed to gays and lesbians and it helps break down those stereotypes. So it's those kind of things. The ad campaign, um, anything that needs a group level to do, they need to raise money to be able to keep this going. And I think that's gonna be one of their first priorities. Corlene Kraft member. You've mentioned that, of course, there's a lot of uh, popular support for the gay and lesbian movement in the Democratic Party and made allusions to the fact that perhaps there is next to none in the Republican Party. Is there, uh, is there any strength at all or is there any effort being made to um, gain some strength on that side? Well, the homosexual prostitution ring in Washington, D.C. <laughs> is making efforts. I don't know. <laughs> um, 